Welcome to Animorphs Anonymous, the podcast where we casually discuss the Animorphs one book at a time. I'm Casey. And I'm Alex. And we're going to talk you through the plot of each book. But more accurately, take you on tangent trips, factoid forays, and say, well, actually, as much as possible. Join us on the 1st and the 15th of each month, and we'll take you along on our mission. And we promise to have you back under the two-hour time limit. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army. Hola. Hi. Hi. Let's talk about Bohemian Rhapsody. (laughs) Oh yeah, so we're going to talk about Bohemian Rhapsody because we need a happy thing to talk about before we dive into this horror fest. Okay, I know it's like mid-December when this is coming out, but... We're recording it earlier, and mm-hmm. Alex and I just saw Bohemian Rhapsody. What did you think? I, I, I'm so confused right now. Like, I really want to see it again because I really like loved it, and I found myself at a lot of the performance parts like just like smiling to myself like an idiot. Uh huh. Like I loved it, and I just wanted some of the other parts of it to like be more intense or profound. And they were mm-hmm. just kind of dismissed really quickly. I don't know. Uh-huh. I don't know. What'd you yeah. think? I I thought I was gonna be more emotional about it. Cause you know, mm-hmm. you know me, I cry at the drop of a hat. <laughs> um you know, whether something is sad or happy or epic, but I like like I enjoyed it for sure. And yeah, yeah. agreed. Like I was also like smiling like an idiot during, you know, a lot of the performance parts, but I didn't like cry which i was expecting to yeah i I don't know no i i know what you mean it was just like a lot of the parts that were supposed to be really emotionally intense were just kind of kind of washed out yeah yeah um what i the actors were like spot on way to go tim Tim, yeah, <laughs> Tim from Tim from Jurassic Park plays uh, John Deacon, the bassist, and I just loved his face so much. Me too. It was he was always like, making that kind of like squinty, like sort of expression. Yeah, and they call it out in the movie too, <laughs> like do. when Freddy's like going around the room, like I need you, and he's like, I need your stupid face expressions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just loved it. And the guy who plays Brian May looks exactly like Brian May, and it freaked me out the whole time. That's exactly what Scott said when we walked out of it. He's like, that guy looked exactly like Brian May. Yeah, they cloned Brian May. They pretty much did, yeah. Horrifying. Um, hair, so good. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure what to think about it when I saw it at first but the more i think about it the more i just want to see it again i i definitely want to see it again i like walked out of the theater and i'm like i want to see that again because i feel like there's a lot that i would get into and especially because i went in like knowing that the timeline was fucked and like it wasn't yeah all like denoted correctly and like when he found out he had aids versus like like they were on tour together when they did live aid like it wasn't like they just came together so like there's moments like that where i'm like oh this is so contrived but like i want to go in and be like okay now i have no expectations so like let the technicalities go yeah i don't know yeah no i agree um, but um, Rami is R- Rami Malik. Is that how you pronounce it? R- Rami Malik. Yeah. Rami Malik. He was amazing. Oh gosh, yeah. He was so good. Wow, he deserves him. an award. He does, and like he, if you watch like the Live Aid performance, which the I believe most, if not all of it, is on YouTube. It like it wasn't like frame for frame exact but he captured it so perfectly oh. it was so good yeah oh man so oh, so good love it love it I love it so much and like the cool um, part too with the sound wave through the audience mm-hmm. oh that was so good would you recommend it to humans like just all humans <laughs> like all of yeah. humanity i would i mean i yeah 
Why not? Like, if nothing else, you get such a great sense of joy from the performance in there. Mm -hmm. Whenever Freddy is performing, it's incredible. Yeah. So I would recommend it for that, even if other parts of it aren't as strong. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. We should yeah. side podcast. When that comes out on DVD, we should watch it and review it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd love that. All right. It's done. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I I liked it. Um, Would you recommend it for humans? Um, I think... Well, because uh, my, uh, my boyfriend keeps asking if you know, if I wanted to see it again, if he would also enjoy it. But just just to let everybody know, my boyfriend doesn't like anything as far as movies. <laughs> he likes like maybe like 0.1% of all movies ever. Only if they're about space and only if they have a really good soundtrack. Um, okay, but the soundtrack for this movie is of course flawless. Here's the thing though. He does not Don't really even like finish that queen. sentence. How fucking dare you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he likes under pressure. I, <laughs> I know, about that's to be of, under pressure. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to get your rage up for when we talk about the books. Um, it's not gonna work. I have an endless supply of rage. <laughs> <laughs> um, How dare he? I, 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 would, I would say if you're any semblance of a Queen fan, then you should go see it. Um, Absolutely. Th- there's a, there's a lot of details uh, in Bohemian Rhapsody that they got right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like Freddy's um, piano bed and his hundred cats. Yes, um, that was one of the best parts was all of his cats. Yes. Um, but yeah. I, and I would say if you like kind of like character driven or like human interest sort of stories, I think you'll you'll enjoy it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And like after saying that a lot of the interactions kind of paled compared to the performances there is a really interesting turn um when you go through the story where like they really when freddy is kind of like on a downward spiral you really do start to get angry with him like they're really good at kind of manipulating the emotions surrounding him specifically yeah it's when they add in the other people that it's kind of like oh i don't i don't really care sure yeah, one of one of my favorite parts actually was when he like got his big mansion and he was like trying to get Roger to stay for dinner and like Yeah. You know, oh. he was obviously like kind of lonely. So desperate. And he just wanted to like hang out with his friends. Mm-hmm. Um and that was kind of contributing to his his spiral. Um Yeah, I just thought that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. But Yeah, you oh. could feel the desperation in that scene. Yeah. It was really uncomfortable. I want to I want to watch it again. I want to watch it again. Okay, but tell Matt, first of all, he's wrong about not liking Queen. Let's just he get is. that out of the way. Yeah. And also, yeah. it does have an astrophysicist in it, which is right? an yeah. interest. Uh-huh. Has a dentist. I don't know why. He just strikes me as the type <laughs> that would have good dental hygiene. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh. Electrical engineer. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> The kid from Jurassic Park. I assume he likes <laughs> Jurassic Park because if he doesn't, uh, he's again just wrong. <laughs> uh, he doesn't like anything. How? Why? What? Why is he like this? He likes he likes um, the Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. What? Like I one time I asked him, it's like okay, if you could watch one movie for the rest of your life, like you don't have to watch it every day. But if you could only watch one movie for the rest of your life, what would it be? And he said, The Last Samurai. What? He likes the soundtrack. He likes the score. I don't know. He's weird. God, I just... (laughs) I just can't with him. Like, I know he's super nice and you love him and all that shit, but you have to break up with him. (laughs) This is just unacceptable. Oh, this is why I I I have I don't know. <laughs> this, this is why you have to wait until you're visiting me to yeah. go to a movie. <laughs> if I didn't have you, I would like go insane. You well, understand me. Yeah, we we also like things that are likable. <laughs> yeah, we like things that are good and true and exactly wonderful. Exactly. 
(sighs) (laughs) Although speaking of um, not liking things, Scott is trying to catch up on this podcast, Animorphs Anonymous, welcome. He um he's trying to catch up and he got to episode five and he we we're driving the other day and he goes, I'm just I'm really upset with your podcast. Like I'm really angry. And I'm like, why? Like I'm like, what what the hell do we talk about that you would be angry about? It's not like we're saying that many controversial things and he was like, You've just you've never seen the Patriot. <laughs> Like, oh no, I remember what? that conversation. I had completely forgotten about that conversation until like he started talking about like the melting down the lead and I was like, yeah. "Oh yeah." <laughs> oh no. So last night when we were sitting here, he put on a DVD of The Patriot and I left. I was like, "I'm out. <laughs> Not watching this movie." Oh man. That's funny. <laughs> it was terrible. Oh. Yeah, so that's uh that's where we are. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's something. I mean, if you're going to have beef with our podcast, you know. That's what that's to be worst. mad about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like between between you and Casey, you've never seen any movies. I'm like, that seems true. That's because we just watched Free Willy and Jurassic Park and Fly Away Home over and over and Legit. we were happy. I have not watched Fly Away Home since we moved out of our apartment. Oh, wow. I used to watch it, like, every day, minimum. It was just really comforting to have on in the background while I was working on other things. I mean, things. it's Rogue, your favorite X-Men character, yep. and it's Geese. Yep. What's not to like? It, everything to like. Everything about it. And also, speaking of X-Men, the reason I got into X-Men was because of Iceman. Because of Animorphs. So... Ticky boy. You can trace my love back to Animorphs. Speaking of Jake. Speaking of Jake. <laughs> this is a Jake book. This is a Jake book. Hi, well, Ice Man. <laughs> I, here's the thing, though. I feel like this is actually, I would classify this as a David book, but as told by Jake. I would agree and expand on that and say this is almost an entire team told book. Yeah. Except just through Jake's eyes. But yeah. it's not like like most books that we read are very specifically in that character's mindset. And this one, the team is like working so efficiently as a unit, it almost feels like you instead of us sitting here going like, I wish we were in so and so's head or I wish we got so and so's perspective on this, like we get that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um and Jake didn't have a lot of kind of like character inner turmoil sort of situations. Mm -hmm. It really was just like, this is a plot book, but told by Jake. Um, Yeah. Which isn't a bad thing um, because I think pulling back the curtain a little bit, this is a double feature we're doing here. The next book is very much like this is a character having character inner turmoil. Yes. And so probably one of my favorites the next one this one is very very good too yeah this arc is just it's intense it's very oh, intense. so much rage but it, it makes you appreciate the the main team the dream team like yeah for as much beef as we had with like oh this person did something stupid or this person should have checked in with this person and these people should tell jake how they feel no like once you add this, like, chaotic piece of shit motherfucker into this <laughs> team, you see, like, these kids are fine. Like, ugh. See, that's the thing, though. It's like, these kids are fine, but then the next book is all, these kids are not fine. Yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, it's, it's, but it's such a, it, they are, they're, they're fine. Like, they're, they're doing so good. Yeah. And it's like, but, you know. I don't I don't want to get into it yet because this yeah. will, <laughs> this will be a discussion. Yes. Okay, cool. Let's do this and get mad. We're going to get real mad. We're going to get real mad. Let's get into it. Cool. Whew. So, Jake is tumbling through the air, screaming alongside four other numbskulls who are all cockroaches. <laughs> Except Axe isn't screaming. And while screaming and falling, Jake has the time to make a guess that this is because they are a telepathic species and did not evolve to scream. Axe just screams for the shits and giggles of yeah. it all. Axe is always like, 
Ah, you're screaming. You're screaming. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. helping. He screams to fit in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing, actually. Um, yeah, so we get a short recap here about uh, this is the Animorphs. This is book two of the David arc, blah, blah, blah. And our favorite six kids are fighting to save the Earth. And they just added another member named David because he found the blue box. And so they added him to the team. The team all gained the power to morph and blah, blah, blah. A few months in the construction site. It's basically just the literal recap that we do, but told in hyperspeed. And instead of getting like the breakdown of like, this is Rachel, this is Axe, this is Cassie, blah, blah. It's literally like, okay, we got power to morph. We added a new dude. It's, you know, interesting kind of a and thing. And now we're all falling to our deaths. And now we're all falling to our deaths. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I did write this note that cracked me up, actually, when when I was reading it just now. And it was like, they came across a downed alien ship and met Fangor, who gave them fuck all and the power to morph and left five <laughs> idiot teenagers to defend the entire human race and planet. We <laughs> we. Um, yes. So anyways, uh, David, the only thing you need to know about him to make every assumption you ever need to know is that he has a cat named Megadeth and an illegal cobra named Spawn. Yay. Fucking. Piece of shit. And I'm trying my best right now to remember David is still an Animorph right now. Take that with you. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know. Sorry, fans who are somehow using our podcast to catch up. Spoilers. (laughs) I guess. Infer from that sentence what you will. Um, Yeah, so anyways, Rachel and Tobias did not make it into the helicopter, which was, you know, the whole... If you guys remember back to our last episode, there's a president, Marine One, everybody is impressed with Tobias for knowing Marine One, blah, 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 gets sucked up, acquires a guy with a shoe, they get sucked out. That was where we ended the last book. Here they are, falling through the air. Rachel and Tobias did not make it in there. They catch these cockroaches and take them to a safe space where Marco can bitch uninterrupted. (laughs) <laughs> and he does. And he does. <laughs> Marco I, loves his bitching. <laughs> he um he keeps going about like, okay, we just did this crazy thing. I've officially gone insane, insane in the membrane. And I was still on my Bohemian Rhapsody high, so I really wanted him to start saying, I'm going slightly mad. Oh. I was like, do it. God, you're going to love my notes for the next book. I have a Bohemian Rhapsody reference in there. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, um... He did. He went insane in the membrane. And I did not go Bohemian Rhapsody with that. I just started doing the insane in the the membrane. membrane. Insane in the brain. Yeah. Um, Yep. (laughs) So everyone demorphs, including David, who is now naked because he's shitty. Gross. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) because he's shitty. Because he's shitty. Only shitty shitty people are naked. (laughs) That's that's my rule. (laughs) Only shitty people are naked. No. And Tobias is like, I got this, and flies off while everyone else is sitting there. And David is whining about someone coming along and seeing his tiny baby junk. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Jake assures him oh, that God. the giant alien standing next to you will be the center of attention, you dumbass. <laughs> Ugh, fucking A. I'm sorry, my emotions about David are really coming through. Let me you know what? In. He killed a crow for no reason. He did. I've hated him since then. I... So. I can't remember when I first hated him, but it's the only emotion I've really felt since childhood consistently. <laughs> yeah, so Tobias comes back and he's got some swing tr- swing, some swim trunks and a Grateful Dead t-shirt. And Jake makes a point to tell David, we will be paying back this swim shop. We do not steal. We're not even going down that road. And Aww. then David makes a pitiful joke about stealing jewelry. And it doesn't really sound like a joke. And then uh, when Marco kind of reprimands him for this, he whines a lot. Um, Jake makes a mental note to talk to Cassie about her read on David. Um, This is, he really blatantly calls out in this book that he needs Cassie's read on every situation here. Like, he really values her ability to do that. Yeah. So, I like it. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, they start talking about sneaking into the giant summit again, and they make a decision to get their scouting morph, which is seagull. David begs to turn into an eagle and take down one of the seagulls. And, Jake... and I was like, fucking get rid of him. Yeah. Yes. Um, and th- this part, too, where um, Jake's like, no, 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 Tobias, go get us a seagull. And Tobias 
makes some sort of commentary about like how yeah it's like you know super easy i'll go get them they they've got nothing on me blah 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 and um somebody makes a comment about like how tobias like respects certain birds and how he doesn't he thinks that like seagulls and pigeons and everything are beneath him blah blah blah. and racist uh, racist oh my god david tries to call tobias a racist and cassie kind of explains to him why that's not quite right they're different species not the same species and and david just gets sulky and i'm like i hate him so much why are you such a fucking dick like oh my god fuck you dude uh sorry i no i'm i'm with you also i think it's funny how um like tobias has been very disdainful about seagulls you know he calls them rats with wings or whatever mm-hmm. but like you never think for a second that he's going to go catch a seagull and like you know hurt it very badly never i'm just so mad um but no you're totally right everything he hunts he hunts to eat and he carries a great amount of respect for that yeah and he's a good boy unlike david who is not a good boy exactly exactly and tobias it's such a struggle within himself to make it right and like just thinking about when cassie asked him like don't touch these skunk babies and he spent how long protecting that like yeah he's proven in himself yeah yeah to and be it's like such... a person with morals exactly exactly <sighs> jesus um but yeah so anyways tobias grabs a seagull no problem he brings it back slightly annoyed but completely uninjured <laughs> and cassie snuggles it which is so cute yeah she does <laughs> i don't think the seagull would like necessarily love that yeah no they're not super snuggly but yeah <laughs> um So David and Tobias acquire the seagull. So Tobias now has his seagull morph, which, again, something I spoiled for you in, like, two books ago in Megamorphs. I'm sorry. Oh, I don't remember that. It's fine. Okay, good. (laughs) But yeah, so they get seagulls, and they're scouting around, looking at all the security that's surrounding this resort. And, like, there's a ton. And they're looking for kind of any chink in the armor here. So they're, like, seeing guys on the beach, and... um. David mentions at this point, like, my dad's security, so I know everything. My father will hear about this. My father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Sure. I would like him so much better if he were Draco Malfoy. My God. Fucking asshole. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Choose Potter. Rocket ship Potter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish he were Draco Malfoy, because then at least he would have one redeeming quality. I don't know what that is, but it's whatever it is. David doesn't have it. Yep. Anyways, um, yeah, so David's all like, my dad knows about security, so I know. <laughs> and uh, they see, like, dudes all over the beach. Um, some of them very obviously security. Some of them are undercover. There's, like, guys in the same suit golfing on the golf course. Very obviously security. It It's just covered. Um, Jake gets momentarily happy that there's a canine team, but that quickly gets dismissed because how's that going to work? I, I was super excited. I was like, yes, get a German Shepherd morph. That's my <laughs> get favorite. Get a Shepherd. Get a Shepherd. My favorite Shepherds. Yes. I love them. Yeah. I mean, it would just, it would be one of those things that's hard to. Yeah. To, yeah. It was a little bit of a red herring because I thought they might go that route, but then they didn't. Yeah, then they didn't. Um, and they see food crates, which, like, they're, you know, I'm assuming that's a callback to when they did that for the mental hospital. But they're like, oh, guys are inspecting every crate. So, no, that's also a no-go. <laughs> um, spiders. Yeah. Yeah. Spiders and bananas. <laughs> uh, so, Jake's, like, narrating and, like, telling us, like, it, basically we can't see a way in. And then he gets a painful shock. And he's like what the fuck what was that from oh my god it creates all sorts of confusion because jake was like ah i'm assuming very stoically but like in pain you know (laughs) and um so he's looking around for a minute or two and then he sees a guy that's watching the birds very intently um next thing tobias gets hit and cries out in pain and jake is sure it's this balding guy that's watching the birds intensely and Axe confirms, like, oh, yeah, it could be, like, a low-level Draken beam that, um, you know, is, is channeled through the sunglasses. And he's basically just trying to discourage the birds from coming too close. Sure enough, he hits an honest-to-God seagull, and it spazzes out and then flies away. 
and they're like, ah, oh, shit, what do we do? Um, so Cassie gets hit next, and Jake goes, all right, bail, bail, come on, you got hit, leave. But everybody else, stay where you are, because we have to pretend that we're actually seagulls. We can't tip them off that we were here. Uh, and David's like, what do, what do I do if I get a boo-boo? Because he's a fucking whiny bitch. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. I'm seriously going to try to rein it in. So David's no, like, what? <laughs> I'm going to try a little. Because otherwise it'll just be me cussing this guy out after a while. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, David's like, I, I, you know, what do I do? What if I get hit? And Jake says, you just have to take the hit and then you can leave. And uh, so he does. And Jake feels terrible about this. But why? He, Sorry. Because he doesn't want to get his team hurt. You know, David's still the, the team. He doesn't want anyone to get hurt, even though he's unsure about this kid. Um, So yeah, David gets the shock, and Jake says, okay, you can go. And as David's flying away, Jake says, good job. And David sincerely goes, thanks. And then a second later, he goes, thanks a lot. (sighs) He also, um, when they were flying around scoping out the the place, um, David has an interesting moment with Marco, where... David's like, oh, my father works for the NSA or whatever. And then Marco's like, well, now he works for the controllers. And Jake was like, Marco, that's too harsh. And then Marco, like, kind of pouts for a little bit, but then he apologizes. And I was like, oh, shit, I think David's going to, like, really hurt Marco now. Like, he he probably took that and now he's, like, formulating a grudge. And Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah. Um... Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting, just, like, one-off comments. And I didn't write a lot of them down because it's kind of hard when you're recapping the narrative to, like, Mm -hmm. explain everything up until that moment of the comment and then moving on. But there's a lot of um, really interesting kind of one-off comments or, like, you know, off-the-cuff remarks to David, from David, that it just builds this sense of tension between certain members of the team. Yeah. And it's really interesting Um, and then Cassie, who keeps offering these comments that cools it down and, like, diffuses the situation, but as somebody who knows Cassie, feels very uncomfortable coming from her, specifically. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's a very interesting read for, like, if you've been in the series and, like, you've been reading it and you kind of feel like you know these characters by now, it plays on that sense of familiarity to create a tension that you might not otherwise get, which is just yeah. brilliant writing. Yeah. So I love that part of it. It's very good writing. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyways, uh, everybody else loops around kind of quietly and is able to get away, except for Jake, who takes a second shock before wheeling away and getting out of there. Um, and Jake makes it home after this mission where his parents are waiting up for him, looking terribly strained. And he immediately goes, oh my God, what's happened? Like, what's, what's wrong? Did I do something? Is Tom okay? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but it turns out it's his cousin Saddler who was out riding a bike and hit by a car. And Jake feels bad that he's immediately relieved that that's what happened. (laughs) Um, and that kind of sends him to a spiral of guilt that's only interrupted by just feeling kind of relieved and then sad again um yeah. as his parents that they will they tell him we're gonna be gone for two days and he's like yay and they're like then if sadler survives we'll be back with our with your aunt and uncle to uh to stay at our house while they transfer to the children's hospital over here which is better wherever here is yeah. and then he's like and they'll be bringing their assorted children and he's like no i hate all the children yeah including their particularly shitty two-year-old so I mean, ugh. there you have it. <laughs> like, I again, I feel Jake's pain. It's like I, I feel guilty that you know that your cousin is severely injured. But I get really stressed out when people come over to my house, like, and have to stay, and I don't know or like them very well. So, yeah, ugh. it's you know, it's it's also like. The way that these people are described, it's not like, oh, your aunt and uncle who it's even if you like somebody, it's very stressful to have people in your space for yes. any amount of time because it's your space and you don't want to yeah. invade it. But um, on top of that, his aunt and uncle are like described as they're nice enough, 
but their kids are spoiled brats and like Sadler was the one that would always like break something and blame it on Jake and get Jake in trouble. Like it yeah. just seems like on top of everything else, these kids fucking suck. Yeah. <laughs> like, and Jake has so much more to worry about and this is just going to put more kinks in the plan. Exactly. It's just not something he wants to deal with on top of everything else. Because this is also, as stressed in the previous book and this book, this mission is their biggest mission yet. This is yeah. the most critical mission yeah. that they've the gone The stakes on. are so high. They're incredibly high. It's the leaders of the free world or multiple leaders of the free world that hold some of the biggest power in the entire like freaking planet. And this is their mission. To yep. save those guys, but one of them's already taken, but they don't know which one. Like, this is high stakes. <laughs> yeah. And David, on top of all of this, is, you know, where what are we going to do with him? Where are we going to keep him? How is he going to settle in? Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just, it's a lot on his plate right now. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Um, Jake spends his big evening alone researching the summit. <laughs> and the tying best... up the phone lines and tying up the phone lines because this is the 90s and no one can make a call when you're on the internet i love that oh i love this so much <laughs> um the best lead he found has to do with the french prime minister's wife who always has her two chihuahuas with her and jake's like yeah chihuahuas and um tom kind of pops his head into jake's room and he's like what's up and jake freaks out and closes all his tabs which is not suspicious at all jake um and tom's like tom's like trying to joke around with him kind of like i'm in charge here midget kind of a thing and and jake's like this is just falling flat he's like i'm not in the joking mood and i kind of just want to tell him like hey i know what you are i know what the game is it isn't funny yeah which would be very bad so he did not do that (laughs) uh so as soon as he is offline tom is correct the phone rings (laughs) but it's not for tom it's for jake and Cassie is calling him to say that David Letterman was canceled. Um, this is a super secret code. I know it's very hard to figure out, but David is gone from the barn. And Jake says, like, hey, Letterman will be here. The normal time, normal place. Meaning Jake's on the way to meet her. Normal time, normal place. The barn. <laughs> same bat so, time, same bat place. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Jake basically hangs out for a minute or two. He pretends to be asleep. Tom checks on him. Tom leaves to go conduct yerk business. And Jake morphs bat and heads over to the barn. Oh, see? Same bat time. Same bat place. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Nails that goof. <laughs> <laughs> um, once he gets to the rehab center, there's this very strange aside where Rachel's hanging out, like, just looking fantastic in a full, like, fashionable set of clothes. And Jake's like, how did you morph that? And Cassie's like, don't you know that Rachel keeps clothes here? And Rachel's like, is it a crime to look good? <laughs> <laughs> there's no point to this. We never discuss this again. Oh <laughs> this is just a very God. strange aside. I love that. So I loved random. It, too. it was so random, but it was this like wonderful moment of levity in this <laughs> horrific series. <laughs> I love it. I loved it so much. Rachel, you you keep doing you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, David's gone AWOL. Uh He's probably so stealing the plan- jewelry. <laughs> probably. Uh, we can't say that mean stuff. Be nice. Alex, be nice. <laughs> okay. So the plan- <laughs> you can be mean. I have to be nice. Uh, the plan is for Rachel to go to Owl and find Tobias and Axe. Jake's- Jake is going to morph Wolf and track down David's scent, but that won't do. What if he's seen? So instead he morphs Homer and Cassie makes him finish the morph outside of the barn because of all the small animals inside. And Jake kind of hobbles out like half werewolf, <laughs> half, <laughs> half weird, um, and finishes his morph outside it's this hilarious moment where Jake goes sniffing around and, like, finds old poop, and he gets super pumped. And then Cassie's <laughs> like, come on, pay attention. And then he's like, I really like Cassie, but I'd like her more if she had a stick. <laughs> Cracked me up. I'm a dog. Um, Hello. Hello, I'm a dog. <laughs> and uh, Cassie does get his attention eventually onto a shirt that David wore, and Jake is off to track him down. Okay, one Tracks. quick point. Yes. Um... In the barn, I think they mentioned that Marco couldn't come because his dad was on a date. Yes, and uh, his dad was going to check on him when he got home, so he and had I'm to be like, there. Yeah, and I'm like, 
How does Marco feel about this? About his date? About his dad dating. Like, knowing that his mom is still maybe alive. I don't yeah, know. I, but he can't. I mean, you know, you know Marco. Like, he's not the one that would be overwhelmed by his emotions. Like, if Cassie were in the scenario, she'd be like, no, dad, you can't do Thanks, this. Yeah. yeah, but Marco's like, I can't break cover. It's a compromise sure. to the situation. Yeah. Just ignore it. I know. I don't know. I read into that a little bit. No, that's that's good. That's good. It's an interesting point because we just visited Marco and he did not mention this in his narrative. Yeah. So it'll be a little while, but we'll hear from Marco again. Cool. We'll hear his thoughts and feelings. So Jake tracks David. David yes, David. He does. Um, he tracks him away from the barn and then he finds out that David morphed to lion and Jake freaks the fuck out like he morphed in this giant predator what the fuck is he doing which is fair what the fuck is he doing (laughs) um and cassie reminds him like hey remember when we first got our morphing abilities he probably just wanted to test it out and i seem to remember you running along a bunch of rooftops as a tiger at one point i don't remember that uh i think it was in the original megamorphs when they were um going around when rachel was like elephant running through the neighborhood and they were fighting sure i mean Seems like slightly different scenarios, <laughs> considering that was in a battle and this is not. But I, you know what? Not my place, man. Sure. Seemed to calm Jake down. Cassie has the read on this. Yep. I won't interject my opinion. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So Cassie reminds him, like, hey, when you were Tiger, you did some stupid shit. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, I guess I'll forgive him for now. Jake continues to follow the lion scent and is eventually joined by Rachel and Tobias. They couldn't find Axe for whatever reason, um, but they track David down to the side of the highway where he morphed from lion to human to eagle. And Jake and Cassie, or Jake asked Cassie what he talked about before she said goodnight, basically. And um, she said, oh, he was just talking about how he, you know, wanted a normal night, watching some TV, etc. And Jake goes, oh, got it. I know where he is. And, like, a few minutes later, Jake is inside the Holiday Inn knocking on a door. (laughs) And the TV goes muted. And Jake goes, hey, man, it's me. I know you're in there. And uh, David answers the door. And Jake tries to reason with him. But David is being a jackass. So, David... (laughs) (laughs) Seriously, he's being such an asshole. David tries to tell him that Jake can't control his life. He's like, hey, it's like school and home life. Like, when I'm with the Animorphs and I'm with you, you're in charge. When I leave, it's my own time. And Jake's like, no, that's not how this works. We are a team. We are a unit. And you can't compromise us because you want to watch TV. Like, no. And um, it's not getting through to David. So the conversation ends with Jake saying, like, hey, if you can't conduct yourself properly, then we can't have you around. And Jake said, it sounds like I was threatening him. I was. Damn. It, that's where, like, it started to get intense. Yeah. Like, Jake is not putting up with the shit. Oh, man. Um, so, Cassie mentioned earlier, she did have a plan to get into the resort. We cut to back to the meadow. Because the kids can't go to the barn during the day. They've all skipped school on this Friday together, which is risky, but they decide to do it. So um, she's like, I have this freaky plan to get in. And they're all like, all right, tell us what it is. And they're all hanging out in Tobias's meadow, which sounds like a great fucking time. Yeah. Yeah. And Cassie's plan is one of them is going to morph Dragonfly, which Cassie has conveniently already caught and has in a jar in her bag. And the rest of the team is going to morph fleas because like six dragonflies, seven dragonflies, whatever, however they're going to run this mission is going to be slightly obvious. So everybody else morphs fleas and they are going to hang on to the dragonfly and for extra security, bite the dragonfly. <laughs> do you, um, yeah. do you watch the, the true facts videos on YouTube? Have you seen that channel? No, I have not. Oh, it's like a man narrating um, over like animal footage, and he kind of like interjects some facts, but mostly it's just goofs. You should check it out. They have a dragonfly one. All right, I'll watch it. Cool. We I'll can cut that out. No. No. I mean, fine, we can. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, everyone is super grossed out by this plan. 
but David cannot seem to read the room, so he doesn't seem to understand that the pushback that they're giving Cassie is just banter, and it's just them, like, blowing off some steam about this morph. We have, like, our very usual interaction where they're like, oh, Cassie, sometimes you freak me out, blah, blah, blah. And David's the only one that is very seriously, like, are we, we're really doing this? This plan is insane. We're not doing this, right? Like, you, this is a joke, right? And everybody else is kind of like, yeah, Cassie, isn't this a joke? Ha, ha, ha. But they... They are very cohesive, and it is very apparent in this scene that David just does not gel with the team. Yeah. And And not like Tobias doesn't gel, because we talked about this when Tobias first got his morphing powers back. That was like, I am inexperienced, and I don't know what my role here is, but he gets there. Yeah. This is more like he just cannot mesh with these personalities. And this is where, this is one of the instances where, I hate to say it, but I, like, I feel kind of sorry for David because I've been there. Like, I've been the outsider in a group that I'm trying to, like, gel with and it just doesn't work out. And I know that feeling of isolation. Mm-hmm. But I'm also not a dick, so, you know, I could be a dick. Yeah, and... and- There are a lot of moments like that, and the team gives him... This is the other thing that sucks, though. The team gives him so much leeway because of that. Because Mm -hmm. they are all concerned about that. And especially, like, Tobias and Marco. Like, they know what it's like to kind of be the outsider in this situation. Yeah. And they really, like... Even Marco said, like, the speech that David made in the last book, he kind of admired that, like, you know, I'm not going to be pushed around. I'm not going to do this. And Marco's like, yeah, that's the right attitude. But it's more than that. It's that, you know, David is inherently just selfish and rude and out for only himself and doesn't care about anyone else. Like, yeah, it's just so much bigger than that. Yeah, and, like, Axe, who is a different, you know, species and, Mm -hmm. you know, misses most of, like, the jokes and, like, everything goes over his head and he's always like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm confused. But, like, he's on the same page, he's in the same fight, and he's, you know, he's there for his team, even if he doesn't quite understand everything. Imagine for a second if the team had <laughs> treated David with the same suspicion that they treated Axe with when he first joined the team. Mm-hmm. Like, catastrophic. <laughs> yeah. More so than it was. Like, it, you're totally right. Axe, better than anyone, knows the situation that David is in right now because Axe also came into a somewhat formed team already. But yeah. it's just the difference in acts is fighting for the same cause and they're still mean to act sometimes they still take advantage of him not knowing and get frustrated and angry with him but at the end of the day they know that they're all fighting for the right reason yep so yeah (laughs) as opposed to david who will sell out his own mother for five dollars on a street corner and he's a, kind of a sociopath. <laughs> he is. I, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyways, they're, they're going to do this dragonfly thing. Uh, yeah. And they decide to draw straws to figure out who gets to be the dragonfly and who has to be fleas. And Jake is the one that pulls the short straw. So he gets to be the dragonfly. Um, which, to be honest, I, I don't know why everybody's against being a dragonfly. Of all the bugs they've morphed, I would want to be a dragonfly. That'd be awesome. It would be amazing. So I don't know why everyone's bitching. But <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, I'd be like, hey, can I can I acquire that after you? Like, I volunteer for... as tribute. I volunteer as dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> and I would definitely be making, like, a ton of, like, I'm Sparks references. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. That comes out next week. I'm so excited. Me, too. Oh, man. Okay. We'll cut that out, though. We yeah. can't date this anymore. Yeah. It'll already be December 15th by the time this is coming out. Yes. Anyways. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so everybody's against the dragonfly morph because of reasons, I guess. Um, and Jake morphs into it. And the only reason this morph is so horrific is because the first thing that happens <laughs> is his eyes morph. I shouldn't laugh, but it's so... It's, you should laugh. It's so funny. Uncomfortable laughter. 
Yeah, his eyes morph and dragonflies don't have eyelids, so he is forced to watch every change that oh. happens to him. And that is the only reason this is so horrific. Otherwise, it would be like kind of business as usual. Um, although there is a really funny part where he apologizes for his butt. Like, <laughs> my butt grew. Yes, sorry, my butt. <laughs> Honestly, like what would animorphs be like if instead of like a proper morph, they like glowed a beautiful color and then just like shaped into the thing like in Pokemon? Oh, I don't know. I feel like the closest we could imagine their reactions being is when Cassie does one of her beautiful morphs, like where yeah. she like grows out her wings into beautiful angel wings or something. <laughs> I don't know. Ugh. It would be entertaining is what it would be. Um But yeah, so uh Jake is forced to watch this this morph and once he gets a dragonfly, he's trying to feel out the instincts and he's like, Oh, there's not much there but then a mosquito kind of wanders past him, and within five seconds, he's fired off the ground, caught the mosquito, and he gains control halfway through eating it. And he's like, oh, God. And he can't look <laughs> away from the mosquito's parts sticking out of his mouth because his eyes are so huge. And this is the second time that Jake has eaten a bug, at least. Yeah, this time, though, it wasn't like... Like, the spider he held on to for a very long time. This time, he's like, oh, gross, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Business as usual. Business as usual. I ate the mosquito. I get over it. <laughs> um, so we cut to Tobias guiding Jake along with these five idiot fleas attached. And apparently it took them forever to get all loaded up because fleas, when they jump, are not so accurate. Um, so he said it was like a Three Stooges kind of deal where they're like bopping around <laughs> everywhere. Um, the fleas are like, slow down! we can feel every wing beat it's like a hurricane and axe is like do not slow down and we are very short on time yeah and uh david has taken to calling them all insane just repeatedly he's just like you are all crazy because they're all like doing their normal like blowing off steam like joking cracking up like all sorts of and david's just like you guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. Like, God. this is insane. He complains so much. Remind me never to complain about Tobias complaining again. Because all David does is complain. Yeah. And the other thing is David is such a wimp. Like, oh, he gets the littlest tiny cut on him. And he's like, oh, I'm injured. <laughs> oh, my finger. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Ugh. Is it is the lion symbolic of having a thorn in his paw being like the biggest detriment to his lifestyle? I don't know. I think I don't he's know. he'd be one of those guys that drives one of those massive trucks. <laughs> and then With it's the like, oh, sorry about your the yeah. back of it. <laughs> It's like, oh, sorry about your penis. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like he, I I feel like he just picked the most powerful morphs that he could to compensate for the fact that he's such a fucking wuss. He's such a wuss. And he like, he's got such a power kink too. Like, yeah. I mean, these books don't stray into that sort of territory. Like Jake just apologized for mentioning his butt. So keep in mind, that's the kind of PG rating we're working with right now. But like, he is such a power tripping, like beyond the normal, like, you know, when a hall monitor feels like they can really screw you over kind yeah. of a thing. Like, he goes beyond that into, like, psychotic territory. Yeah. Like, if we were to put him in a Hogwarts house, like, he'd be in Slytherin, but he'd be Expelled. a bad Slytherin. Oh, yeah, I mean, he he, would, he wouldn't even be at Hogwarts. Um, he'd be a Durmstrang. Yeah. Like idiots. <laughs> but I feel like he's very Slytherin, but, like, a bad Slytherin. Like, I love... You know, I th there are definitely good Slytherins and there are bad Gryffindors and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't believe that one house is bad and one house is good. But he would be one of the quote unquote bad Slytherins, I think. Well, I think it's I, it exactly pertains to kind of what we talked about before when we tried to sort them into houses where like Rachel is a Slytherin, but she's a hero Slytherin. Yes, Whereas absolutely. David would be a Slytherin, but he's a villain Slytherin. For sure. That's yeah, yeah that's exactly what I'm saying. Good job. Yeah, we figured it out. <laughs> and this was when we first sorted houses, which I think was episode one. This is exactly where my mind was, was this arc when I said, really? I think Rachel is a Slytherin. Oh. This was the, what was in my head uh -huh. the whole time. Yeah. 
Hmm. <laughs> so if you're looking for additional insight into why I say things. I am glad that you mentioned that. <laughs> oh, geez. We'll get there. <laughs> um, so they are dragonfly motoring along with a bunch of fleas and... Jake is closing in on this building and he's like, Tobias, are there any open windows? And Tobias is like, I've been looking, I don't see any. So they're like, okay, here, this is going to sound crazy, but he's like, there's some bellmen out front wearing large hats as part of their uniforms and I keep tipping them to the guests. And Jake's <laughs> like, got it, Tobias. I got this. So <laughs> And Axe is like, what is a hat? Yeah, Axe the whole time is like, what, what are hats? Is this more artificial clothing? I love is there that. any part of the body that humans do not clothe? And then Rachel makes a comment like, the face, which is unfortunate for Marco. <laughs> like, it's very good. It's it so is good. very good banter. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that they, like, I just love that they've kept this up throughout this whole book and series and everything. Like, I just, I love the interaction. Yep. Oh, so um, anyways, yeah, Jake makes it over there and uh, the guy tips his hat. Jake scoots in and Cassie, uh, she confirmed that dragonflies can hover. So Jake's like, OK, focus on hovering. And he's like, it is very difficult in pure blackness. When the guy starts walking, he still like bonks into the side of the wool hat. <laughs> he's like, it was the most difficult five minutes of my life. It felt like a lifetime. Um, so Jake's listening to the bellman talk about he he's escorting this news anchor basically and this bellman just keeps talking about hot news anchors from networks that this network anchor is not on Ew. he's like have you ever you know met blah 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 and he's like wrong network dude i'm at cbs and he's like have you ever met so and so and he's like again different network stop Ew. asking me these weird sexist questions you strange bellman <laughs> um <laughs> agree it, it's very uncomfortable yeah and uh, so they are waiting for the dude to tip his hat again. Eventually he does. And the guest that the bellman was escorting was like, oh, something just flew out of your hat. And he's like, yeah, so anyways, have you met so-and-so? And he's like, again, wrong network. Oh, this guy sucks. Yeah. Yep. Um, so they're, they're now free in the hotel. And Jake is desperately trying to find a place where they can demorph. And so he flies into the air vent. He's buzzing around. He sees a room and he goes, oh my God, what's, no, we, like, that's fucked up. But he doesn't really explain what it is. Uh, and then he turns a corner and is stuck to a spider web. Axe at this point is very calmly telling them they have two minutes left to demorph. And everybody else kind of descends into a little bit of chaos. Um, mostly David. Of course. But, of course, mostly David. Uh, they have to demorph, otherwise they're going to be trapped forever. And Jake's like, I got to get heavier to break out of this web. But the whole time that Jake is going through this, like, breaking out of the web, trying to get away, trying to get them to a safe space, David is screaming, I'm going to demorph. And Jake keeps ordering him to hold. Do not demorph yet. Um, so Jake's, like, kind of going uh, but to humans so he can, like, break down this web. But as he starts demorphing, all of a sudden Cassie starts screaming. It turns out that one of his arteries went from dragonfly to human in this demorph and basically blew Cassie's brains out. Um, she falls off of Jake, so he grabs her flea body in his mouth and starts buzzing away. The whole time David's like, I'm demorphing, I'm demorphing, oh I'm already stuck as a flea. It's like, dude, shut up and let everybody work. Come on. Um, and Jake does go tumbling out of a vent, or like flying out of a vent. Everybody else is tumbling out after him. He drops Cassie to the ground and just screams, everybody demorph. And they start to. However, Marco is trapped. Oh. Um, Jake is insisting, keep trying, keep trying. And Marco just ends up growing to this dog-sized flea. And he is pleading for help. <sighs> oh, this is the most stressful scene in the books thus far for me. Like, there's yeah. so many fucking components, like the time and being stuck in the vent and David being a bull in a china shop, just like ruining everything. And Marco's stuck again. And oh, my God. Yeah. And Horrible. The whole scene is like really... Like, it's always stressful with the main team when this sort of thing happens, but... They compose themselves very well in these situations. And even when, like, Marco here loses it, he's not losing it for no reason. 
Yeah. But we have David, who is just like, it's like a normal scene that would happen in a normal book, but with this element of, ah, I'm demorphing. I'm going to cause more trouble. I'm going to cause more stress. I'm going to put more pressure on you guys. And it's like, you just have to stop. Like, yeah. enough. Knock it off. Like, yeah. I, I this is why so you're supposed to stay calm in emergency situations. Yeah. you are literally and, making it worse. And I, one of my biggest pet peeves is when something is going on. I don't have many abilities. And I, I, I swear to God right now, I'm really, like, not trying to brag or anything like that. But, like, I have been in a lot of situations where something's happening and you have to focus on what you're doing and what's the best course of action. Like, you cannot freak out. You cannot scream. You can't run around waving your arms and blah, blah, blah. Right. I... I can do that, but it's it's because I've had practice. Like I've had a lot of practice at it in emergency situations and stuff where you have to act quickly. Mm -hmm. And somebody who runs around behind you, going, "What do we do? Oh my god!" I, I there's no situation where I want to punch somebody more than that. <laughs> oh no! Like it is one of my biggest fucking pet peeves. Like it, it's like stop stop right now i need you to back off and i need you to go sit down and just calm yourself down that's what's gonna help me and then the worst is when they hover and are like can i help what can i do oh my god and i'm like you need to back off is what you need to do <laughs> if i need something i'll let you know <laughs> so things like that just just yeah. drive me nuts yep but yeah so anyways this is what david was reminding me of and it's like one of the things i hate the most in this world <laughs> and david was doing it so Anyways, um, yeah, uh, Jesus Christ. Marco. So Jake starts looking around while Marco's on this table as this dog-sized flea. And it's not like, oh, if Marco got trapped, he'd be a dog-sized flea and it would be some weird hybrid sidekick. It's like his legs don't work at this size. Like, he is just a, just this roly-poly monster thing that is useless. <laughs> like, his life is more than over um it's not like tobias at all so uh cassie pops up first before everybody else she's managed to demorph faster than everyone even with her brains blown out because she's incredible and she places her hands on either side of marco's flea body and she just starts going focus let go of the fear focus on yourself picture yourself just let everything else go and slowly so slowly marco emerges from this monstrosity that he was and he stares at cassie for a second and then just throws his arm around her and starts crying and just repeating you saved my life you saved my life and everybody is staring at cassie and marco just in awe and i i think rachel's the one that kind of breaks the silence with jake she just kind of comes up to him and says i have chills from that that was like nothing we've ever seen before. Agreed. Fucking like, and it means so much in this moment because of like the newfound kind of tension between Marco and Cassie from, from Cassie's mm -hmm. book. And the yeah. fact, oh God, it's so good. This is one of my favorite scenes in the series so far. Like, oh my God, my heart just exploded. Yeah. It, it was like all the tension from the biggest kind of distance between characters like marco was the one who was like i don't trust cassie after this everybody else is like i believe in cassie because she made the right call by letting this yerk go yep marco was the one that said i'm forgiving her because she saved my life before but i don't trust her and i don't trust her decision making and like just to have them have this moment together uh -huh. it was incredible oh so good it was just incredible and it this the kids are just so good together. I love them all. Oh. Except David. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, God. So good. This this moment stands out. And, you know, the last time Marco got stuck, like, the way he got out of it was that he stared at Tobias and was basically like, I, I can't become that. I don't want to become that. Yeah. So the fact that, ah, I just, ah, oh, there's no one way to get out of a morph. And, oh, my God, I, I, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but it's just. Yeah. And it was, it, you know what? That's actually really an interesting point, because the last time Marco got out of that morph with Tobias, he hated Tobias in that moment. Yeah. And Tobias said, I'll take your hate. You hate me and you do what you have to do. And in this moment, 
Cassie almost asserted what she asserted in book 19, where she said, focus on yourself, let it go, let everything else go, and just kind of had this very loving presence, this protective yeah. presence. And that brought him out of the morph, too. And it it's... I mean, we're not in Marco's head, but it's almost like Marco seeing, like, it's not just hate that fuels things sometimes. Sometimes it is the good fight. And it was almost Cassie proving that point that she proved to everybody else in that last book of hers. Yeah. Love. So that's really. (laughs) Yeah. She's the the Captain Planet. Yeah. She's the heart (laughs) of Captain Planet. She's (laughs) heart. That is so true. That's so, so good. And if. David can look at this and still not understand this team and understand at least a portion of how close they are, then fuck him. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> that aside, um, yeah, God, such a good moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is broken up as everybody kind of starts coming back to their senses and looking around the room. And the reason that Jake didn't stop in here before was because it is a giant portable yerk pool um and they're inside a hologram and it rachel starts to go grisly (laughs) after a moment of looking around jake says to rachel reverse the morph i've changed my mind we're not going to do battle morphs and rachel's disappointed that they're not going to be able to fight but she demorphs and uh they start checking out this hologram and they realize that they're inside of a giant pillar in the room and from the outside they're guessing it's a solid and and it just looks like a pillar, but from the inside, they can see everything around them. So Jake steps out and kind of feels his way around, and it's sure it's solid. It feels like solid marble until he gets to the little doorway area, and then he steps back in. And he steps back out again to, like, look at this hologram, but right then, two men and a woman walk into the room, and Jake's like, oh, shit, dives under the table, and is just like, you fucking idiot. Why were you so careless? Um, just to himself. <laughs> and... He's hiding under this table. These people walk right over to where he is, pull out some chairs, and sit down, kicking him in the process. And they're arguing about whether they're going to have the president of the United States and the head of states walk in. And they do say POTUS and, and I assume, HOSs or HOSs. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're, they're arguing about where they're going to have them walk in. And as Jake's laying there, he notices one of the guys that's arguing has a gash on his shoe. It's the guy from the aircraft. And they realize that he is the head of security, basically, here. And he's the one that plans out where all of these important people walk in and walk out and where they're going to stay. And he's in charge of all of that security. And Jake's like, oh, shit. This is way worse than we thought. Yeah. (laughs) Because he's not taking the president and focusing on the one guy. This is like, this plan is way more elaborate. Um, yeah, which um, at the beginning of the book, um, I was kind of like, okay, I, I see if the guy with the slashing issue ends up being the president, like there's going to be issues with Visor 3 acquiring his DNA. Um, yeah. But the fact that it's now he got the head of security instead of the president, that's, that's yeah, it's much worse, like you said. Yeah. Um, it's very bad. <laughs> that bad Yeah. Uh, Eventually, these people finish up their weird-ass meeting, and they leave, and there's a little bit of um, back and forth that leads us to believe that Visor 3 has already started morphing this guy and doing things. Like, mainly they mention, like, hey, you said something completely different this morning. You can't change your mind again. The president's security needs to know well in advance what the plan is. So we get the idea that Visor 3 is already, like, fucking with shit, and it's causing a ruckus, basically. (laughs) Um, meanwhile, while that's been going on with Jake, it's determined that higher up the force field is weaker, so they can theoretically go up and through the roof without much issue. And Axe asks Jake, are you going to destroy all these yerks before we go? And Jake goes, I think that would tip them off. We leave them alive for now. And that turned out to be a very good decision. (laughs) Yeah. Jake says some good, some bad. I only saw the good. Like, I don't know about you, but it seemed all good to me. Well, not only was that a good decision, um, because I would have tipped them off, but I, do you remember that conversation we had back at uh, Andalite Chronicles um, mm-hmm. when uh, Elfanger mm-hmm. had the chance to kill the Yerks and he chose not to? And I predicted that, like, Marco would say yes and Jake would say no. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yes, he said no. I predicted this. Yes. But he, he said no, not 
just for a morality type of reason. He said it right, because, it was... like, logistically, this would be bad. Yeah. Although he didn't necessarily know that at the time, but yeah. Yeah. Yup. Yep. Um, so, they're getting ready to fly up and out of the roof, but they need a distraction so that the controllers on the roof don't shoot them on sight, because a bunch of birds flying out of a roof that looks solid is a little bit, you know, obvious. <laughs> So, um, David points out the fire alarm and he says, I tripped one once in my last school to get out of a test because he's insane. He's such a bad kid. (laughs) Such an asshole. Uh, and so Jake goes, okay, we'll trip it. Everybody go, blah, blah, And David's like, it's my plan. I want to pull the fire alarm. (laughs) So Jake's like, all right, don't fuck it up though, kid. And, uh, (laughs) David pulls the fire alarm and then fucks it up. He trips. He trips. Dumbass. Such a, I just, I always imagine him as, like, this kind of, like, bulky, pudgy kid, like, that wears, like, shitty, like, <laughs> mega death t-shirts, basically. See, I like, was, I just... I was... Don't don't take offense to this. I, I pictured him as kind of, like, one of those, like, pseudo-scene goth kids with, like, the trip <laughs> pants and kind of, like, the Marilyn Manson haircut. Yes. No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, like, yes... Yeah, <laughs> except I always imagine him like really like pudgy too, like just like the type of kid that like would trip on like a slight bump in the carpet because he's sure. so like fucking uncoordinated and ungainly that yeah. he just like can't control his body. Oh my God, I just hate him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, yeah. So, anyways, he, David trips because fucking he's tripping. Whatever. Yeah, he's tripping. And Jake orders everybody else out of the room. And while this is all going on, David rolls under the table and controllers just start bursting into the room, barricading the door. And Jake drops down low to stay out of sight of the controllers that are barricading the door and crawls under the table about 30 feet away from David. Um, David starts morphing into a lion while your controllers are searching the room. And Jake's crawling towards him, mouthing no and shaking his head no, and David just keeps looking him dead in the eye and morphing to lion. And smiling. And Jake's like a creep. And smiling. And Jake's like, no. Um, controllers start yelling to check on the Yerks, and if they're dead, they'll know that this was caused by Andalite Bandalites. But if they're alive, then it's probably just a tripped alarm and there's nothing to worry about. So they tear down the hologram and they see all of the Yerks alive and they're like, whew. Thank God. Not our problem. Put it back up. Let's get out of here. Good job, Jake. Um, Good job, Jake. Very good job, Jake. Very good job. <laughs> um, Jake is still crawling towards David, getting closer. And some of the controllers that are now like on the way out pass by David. And David gets ready to pounce. His haunches tense up like he's getting ready to leap out at them. But right then, Jake reaches him and grabs a fistful of mane. And Jake goes, this is his first time in Battle Morph, and he doesn't know if David has control yet. That's not true, because David did morph right. Lion the other night. Yeah. But, um, to be fair to Jake, he did not see him in that Lion Morph, so he doesn't know if he had control then, either, per se. And David's kind of a loose cannon, anyway. And, yeah, and David's kind of a loose cannon. Although he has never seemed to have problems really controlling morphs. Like, he's lied that he has, But other than the first time you went after Tobias in his very first morph, he hasn't had a problem so far. True. But Jake doesn't know. So um, Jake grabs that fistful of mane and Jake orders him not to do anything. And David bares his teeth at Jake, but doesn't move. And Jake is the ballsiest motherfucker on this planet. (laughs) He's sitting there going, oh, yeah, don't lions hunt their prey by just crushing their skull like a watermelon, and I have my face inches from his teeth? Oh. Just hold it, dude. Just hold it. So oh. he does, like, Jake, fucking go, Jake. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm brave. just, I'm so impressed with him in this moment. Yeah. And just, God, he's amazing. <laughs> um, Jake plays it completely cool this entire time. David, his first words after the threat has kind of immediately passed was something like, I had you worried there. You didn't know if I had control yet, did you? Fuck off. And Jake said, no, dude, I knew you were cool. Like, Jake, fucking cool. Cool as fuck. Um, He's like, no, dude, I knew you had it. 
And David expressed that he's a little surprised that Jake didn't go to Tiger. And Jake goes, oh, you know, I just didn't think it was necessary. Like, very cool. And then David goes, who do you think would win in a fight, a lion or a tiger? What the fuck is wrong with this kid? Oh, God. You fuck. Yeah. Jake just goes, I don't know, but we have to leave, so demorph. Um, and then Jake, after all of this goes down, says, hey, man, like, we got to get out of here. Let's do the dragonfly and flee thing again. But we don't have time for you to jump on me. So just, like, bite me as humans. <laughs> bite like, me, Latch on to me. <laughs> and we'll morph together. Yeah. And it works. Like, after all of that, he's, like, telling this kid, like, okay, bite me. And we'll do this. Bite like, me. dude. <laughs> what? Oh, Jake. I'd be like, don't ever touch me again. I'm going to gut you, you spineless fuck. <laughs> oh, sorry. But Jake is a much better person than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Jake does get to dragonfly david makes it to flee the plan works they get out of there they meet up with tobias and jake just has this question banging around his head who would win in a fight a lion or a tiger jesus (laughs) i was like foreshadowing foreshadowing i i thought of that and then i also thought of um do you remember that show on discovery channel where they'd like pit animals against each other and then yeah I think they did a lion and a tiger, and, like, a tiger, like, 100% of the time would win. Heck yeah. So. What about, what about, what about a tiger and a lioness? I think still the tiger would win. Okay. Like, they're just pound for pound so much more, like, muscular and fast and intelligent than the lion. I I mean, the intelligence you can't really account for here because it's human intelligence in both, but. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And also, tigers are lone hunters, whereas lions are pack hunters, so. Yeah. And the males don't even hunt. That's why I was like the lioness, but. Yeah, yeah. No, I I knew where you were going with that. (laughs) Was it you who told me about the lioness that killed the the male lion in the zoo? Probably. It seems like something I would tell you out of the blue (laughs) for no reason. (laughs) Anyways, uh, so the Animorphs are cutting to their meeting. They're going over what they learned and how everything gets laid out. And the Yerks want to take the president, and here's how they're going to do it. They're going to, like, walk past this podium, blah, 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 and they're going to grab them. They're going to let the hologram keep walking so no one notices. They're going to infest them. Once the speeches are done, they're going to walk back and switch them out. (laughs) This is just like a great mouse detective with, like, the robot queen. Do you remember that? No. Oh. But yes, it is a very stupid plan. They talk about what their plan is, and then they're trying to figure out where the head of state fits into all of this and why Visor 3 has to be there. And the boys are kind of taking stabs at it. And Cassie's the one that says he's there because of his ego. He wants the, to be the one that said, like, hey, I had my direct hands on the master stroke that got the president. I'm the one that won this war by getting this guy infested. It was me. My fingerprints are all over it. I'll be Visor 1 today. I'll be in the Council of 13 tomorrow. Like, that's that's kind of his thought, and Cassie nails it. And the boys are kind of a little bit put out, um, but as usual, everybody accepts it except fucking David. Yep. So, um... Rachel says they should all head home, put in an appearance. Their parents are probably going to ground them all. And Jake's like, actually, I'm free. Haven't you heard about her cousin? And he starts telling her because she had no fucking idea because apparently Rachel's mom has not been really talking to that side of the family since the divorce. Uh, But um, he lets Rachel know what's going on. And David has a weird look, but Jake kind of dismisses it. I hate that. Um. Jake then pulls Cassie aside very quickly, and she accurately guesses that he wants to ask her about David. And Cassie says she doesn't really know, although it's very clear she's made uneasy by him. Yeah. She just says, I don't know, like, we gotta give him a chance. And Jake accepts it. And she just goes, I advise you worry about one thing at a time, though. Let's worry about this mission, and then we can worry about David. And Jake's like, okay. And so he does. (laughs) Um, the current plan is they're just going to fly into the hologram and take out the controllers and then unmask the Yerk before everybody and force these people to acknowledge that they're being invaded by aliens. You know, classic Animorphs plan. Woohoo! The one that never works. 
the one that never works, and yet we keep trying it. (laughs) Uh, Marco says, the plan is insane, like uh, 50 or so times. Um, Everyone's flying, carrying tiny weights back to this summit where they're having this big presentation thing this night. And Rachel's the only one carrying not a fishing lure weight. She's carrying Marco, who's a cobra. (laughs) So cute. They fly as high as they can at night. And Axe deems it most likely high enough to enter the force field. And everybody's like, oh, great, my favorite, most likely, okay. <laughs> and Axe is like, I will go first. And they're like, oh, and how will you know if it's bad? And Axe is like, if I crumpled to the ground unconscious, it was not high enough. And they're like, okay, thanks, Axe. <laughs> oh, sweet baby. <laughs> He's so funny. Um, he makes it, and he is way more pleased about this than he should be in my opinion he's like ha ha i knew the yerk force fields were shit fuck all you um (laughs) god damn it axe i love love you so so much much. my favorite (laughs) he's so good and in this book he's so good and he is so uh, unapologetically a part of the team there is it's never like, oh, this is our alien axe, unless the scene is specifically them demorphing and it calls to to point that out. It's he is such he's integrated so well with the team at this point. It's which is so good. A really interesting comparison to David. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And it's even David like even Axe at his worst is no comparison to how much it sticks out that David is not a part of this team. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Anyways, um, right. The plan is insane. They fly as high as they can. They enter into this force field and they start dive bombing these controllers that are below them inside of this pillar space. So they're just carrying these lures and they basically get to, like, a point where they just drop them and, like, nail these guys in the head. And it's Jake, and then uh, David comes in second as the eagle, and then it's Cassie and, and Axe. And they are they fling these things at the guys and knock them unconscious. And then Rachel tears down to the bottom of this pillar, lands, puts Marco down, and he just delivers, like, I don't know, a non-lethal dose of toxins to these guys to keep them unconscious. Uh, is that a thing? <laughs> No, that's definitely not a thing. Oh, jeez, definitely not a thing. All right. Um, I'm pretty sure that like it, like disintegrates internal organs. I don't think it's just like, oh, here's an antidote. What? Like, uh, would a rattlesnake be better though, or what? That is that also like super lethal? I don't know, because it doesn't rattlesnake just like slow down the heart and everything by like doing something weird with your blood like making it not coagulate properly maybe so that might be better because that would be like you have like you can take them down to a low blood pressure which just keeps them unconscious yeah whereas like cobra actively i believe actively eats through yeah Yeah. so it would have been better if marco and axe had switched I mean, we just really want to drive home the point that Marco has spawn and is morphing spawn <laughs> right in front of David. Sure. <laughs> I think that's really what's happening here. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, they, they get to the bottom of the thing. They grab server uniforms that were in there. They acquire the humans, which everybody seems to have discussed the morality of and made an exception because this is such a high stakes mission. Mm-hmm. They decide they'll do it this one time but again only because the president of the united states and also the prime minister of russia and france and you know other nations i think they said japan was there as well like the heads of all of these nations are going to be infested so this is high stakes enough that they're like yeah we'll do it it's not good still um right but yeah so anyways they they morph those guys they get dressed in the tuxes but that puts them behind schedule, like way behind schedule. Also, Rachel's the only one that knows how to tie a tie I, in this group of miscreants. Fucking one of my favorite scenes ever is none of the boys know how to tie a tie for Axe. And Rachel is just like, oh my God, move. And she just like starts dressing him. And it's so fucking cute. It is. And I also love the fact that they're like, Rachel had him dressed and presentable before the rest of us could even like button up a shirt. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, my So favorite. good. So cute. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're, they're getting ready to go as in these server morphs and clothes, but something's nagging at Jake, and he couldn't figure it out. And then the first person walks past the podium, and nobody grabs him. Jake's like, okay, we'll see what happens now. Uh, second person goes up. And Jake can't figure out why this isn't working as it should until he realizes all of a sudden this is a trap. He orders everybody to battle morphs immediately and asks Axe, as this was going on, if it's possible to have a hologram inside a hologram. And that's when Visor 3 starts laughing and steps out of the Russian speaker. Gross. He, uh, he's the worst. Um, <laughs> The hologram disappears, the main hologram in the room with all the people that are having these discussions and drinking and, and talking, blah, blah, blah. That hologram disappears, and there are 30 hork left surrounding the pillar with guns drawn, draken beams drawn on them. And then Visitor 3 orders the internal hologram shut off, and all of a sudden the Animorphs are exposed and surrounded. The hork have all of their draken beams trained on them, but Visitor 3 had said... Six of you, you know, should surrender, blah, blah, blah. He's doing his monologuing thing. And Jake's like, six of us, six of us. Okay, so someone's missing. And he's like, I see Tobias, blah, blah, He's like, oh, a snake. And he's like, Marco, you're still undetected. And Marco's like, oh, yeah. And he's <laughs> like, okay. He's like, let's let's do this. I, I have a plan forming. Unfortunately for Jake, David is there. And David <sighs> is a fuckwit. <laughs> No holds so, barred. He's just a fuckwit now. He's a fuckwit now. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because David goes to Jake. They're in this situation where it's imperative that they maintain their cohesiveness as a team. And David goes, Jake, are we going to die? And no one answers him because they don't know. They fucking might. Maybe you should just try to get out of the situation instead of pulling this. But no. Is that what David does? No. No, it's not. So Cassie is next to him as a wolf. David's a lion. And Cassie's, like, trying to comfort him. She's, like, nuzzling him, like, hey, it's okay. You know, we're, we're gonna, we're trying to get out, blah, blah, blah. And Visor 3 orders them to demorph. And David's like, I'll do it. I'll demorph. I'll demorph right now. I don't care about it. And then Cassie bites him on the back Good leg. Good girl, Cassie. Good job, Cassie. I only wish you had a gone for the balls. <laughs> <sighs> it's probably too rated R for this book. <laughs> so David keeps freaking out, trying to sell them out, you know, because he's David. And uh, Jake the whole time is telling Marco, like, okay, I think that the hork holograms, Marco sneak up on them. And then he's like, Rachel, can you please... Cassie and David are fighting. Can you please just do something in this situation? And Rachel just kind of bashes him on the head, which <laughs> stuns him. Boof. And the whole time, Visor 3 is like, what the fuck is happening? He's like, why are you fighting amongst you? I order you to stop. <laughs> and like, He's so bamboozled. And even Visor 3, even Visor 3 is like, I'm going to kill that lion first. He's the asshole here. <laughs> even Visor 3 knows how much of an asshole David is. <laughs> God! Oh my god, it's chaos. It's chaos! And it's all David's fault again. Yeah, I have oh like god. several lines of notes at this point that's just all caps saying like, I hate David. David, fuck you, David. I hate him. Ah, fuck this kid. Just over and over. I hate David. I hate him so much. Ugh. And I'm about to hate him more. Yes. So. So mad right now. <laughs> Jake's like, Marco, bite one of the hork Because none of them are looking at Marco. And Marco's like, buddy, you better be right. And Jake's like, I hope so too, dude. <laughs> um, and so Marco takes a shot at one of the hork And sure enough, nothing but air. <laughs> so Jake cheers. And he, this whole scene is a little confusing. But... Jake basically calls out Visor 3 on, like, hey, these are holograms, and he's going to pounce at him. David's closer, though, and David's like, I want to do it. And Jake's like, okay, take the shot at Visor 3. Don't fuck it up. So he pounces, and human controllers burst through the hork holograms, and one of them manages to shoot David with a gun, 
and he flinches and lets Visor 3 go without delivering the killing blow. Because, oh no, a little bullet hit me on my little shoulder. God, this God. baby. Not a good baby. Bad baby. I just... <laughs> I hate him so much. Like, Marco, who never wanted to be in this fight, has been completely eviscerated before and kept going. Mm-hmm. Still punched through the window to get the chi... the Or get the Pamelite crystal to the chi. He's been ripped and- in half as a dolphin. He was ripped in half. Rachel's had so many things burned off. Her half of her face melted off. Cassie's eaten by had, ants. He's gotten eaten by ants like three times at this point. Like Jake's been a fly Cassie, and smeared everywhere. Yeah, Cassie's been a flea. Jake's had his parts reassembled in the bathroom before to try and demorph. Cassie's had her brains blown out fourteen times from explosions, from blood vessels. Tobias, I don't even want to go there so much shit has happened to him and like acts going through like everything these kids go through and david gets hit one time and it hurts a little and he can't do anything about like dude oh yeah awful yeah so david backs down because i hate him (laughs) Visor 3 starts morphing because he now is just free and clear of David, the fucking wuss. <laughs> and that's not even, it's not even strong enough language. He's, and not even saying a coward is a strong enough language for him. But I digress. He's still an animorph right now. So I'll hold <laughs> my he? rage for, you know what? <laughs> um, for a, a short time, yes. Um, anyways, uh, da, 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 moving along. Um, Visor 3 starts morphing while the rest of the Animorphs take out the human controllers, and Visor 3 orders that they switch, the human controllers switch to Drake and Beans from guns so as not to draw attention, but then Axe steps in and puts his tail blade to, tail blade to Visor 3, which is a very interesting moment as the two biggest outcasts in the group, how David will fail, but Axe always steps up to the plate. My best boy! <laughs> <laughs> this leaves them at a stalemate. Uh, Visor 3 starts asking him about the human one. Which one of you is the human? Because he's guessed that the Andalites wouldn't have abandoned or killed David. Instead, their honor, their twisted Andalite honor, would make them adopt David into their group. And Jake says, David, do not say a word, but whiny McWhiny Pants <laughs> gives up the ghost immediately. And is like, because Visor 3 is like, oh, if you tell me which one you are, I'll give you your parents. And he's like, my parents? <laughs> Oh, I love them. Give so them mean. back to me. Everybody hates me. Well. Man, nobody likes it. Call a fucking wambulance. <laughs> um, luckily, even though he's about to sell them out as all being human, he doesn't actually get to say too much because guards are bearing down on the room and everybody has to exit. Both sides have to back down before the president's security shoots them up. So they retreat and they go home. And this is my favorite scene in the book right here. They're flying back home. And Jake says, I know exactly when and why every single member of my team is going to snap. And he says, starting with Marco, don't say a word. And then he goes to Rachel. He says, do not say a word. And then lets everybody else know one by one. Don't say anything to him. And David starts out with this whole, like, you didn't really think I was going to give us up to Visor 3, did you? Because that was just, like, a a thing, blah, blah, blah. And then Rachel makes some sort of snarky comment back to him. And he accuses Rachel of being a coward. Fuck you. I think she calls him a coward. And he's like, maybe you're the coward, Rachel. Fuck you. And Jake privately says to her, do not say another word. And because Rachel who is a loose cannon, is a part of this team still and still fighting for the good fight, she backs down and lets herself be called a coward because you're fucking amazing, Rachel, and David's a piece of shit. Oh, my God. Fucking love Rachel. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That must have been so hard for her. (laughs) It must have been the hardest thing. Oh, my God. And eventually, David stops doing this like you guys don't you you don't think i was gonna sell you out thing right to the whole like 
I had him. I was gonna kill him. It's so lucky I was there. Visor 3, he and I, we have a score to settle. Fuck. And starts bragging. Oh. And they all let him continue on. And some of the more emotionally balanced members of the team, aka Cassie, is like, yeah, you did great back there. You saved my life. I owe you one. Which, just another moment that I felt my stomach churn. Yeah. Where I just wanted to vomit. Yeah. Like, <sighs> Yeah. And I know she's manipulating mm-hmm. him. I know. But it hurts. Like, what? every time she, like, comforts him or nuzzle him, I'm like, don't! He sucks! Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, they all get back to the barn. They head for their houses. And Jake gets to his house to check in. But instead of sleeping, all he does is he makes a mess, he fucks up his bed, he leaves the TV on, and then he leaves. <laughs> and... That's all to convince Tom that he's home, uh, but he heads back to the barn, and he goes into the back of Cassie's dad's truck. He knows Tobias and Axe are nearby, but he's also on watch, sitting in the back of the truck. And then it starts to rain lightly, which Jake says when it's the middle of the night, you're in nothing but morphing clothes and it's raining on you. There's no such thing as lightly raining. He realizes that Cassie's dad still leaves keys in the truck, despite everything that happened in Megalore's <laughs> fun. <laughs> And so he crawls into the truck, he turns the radio on low, and he says things got infinitely better there. Um, He hangs out, he's falling asleep, until Axe raises the alarm. He says, the eagle has left the barn, there's a traitor in our midst. (sighs) Man. No one saw that coming. (laughs) No one saw that happening. But Jake, throughout that whole time, was hoping against hope that he was going to be wrong. That was his last ditch attempt. That was his last ditch attempt. And he has given David so many chances. Yep. And I greatly admire him for that. But, oh, man. Yep. Anyways, um, Axe and Jake are flying. They're, they're not really sure to where. And they're calling for Tobias, but he isn't answering. So they decide to head to David's old house. Jake and Axe are having a discussion while flying. And Axe asks what they would do when. And then stops. And Jake goes, when, what, what, ask your question, Axe. And he goes, if David is a traitor, what do we do? And Jake goes, I don't know. And he gives him a list of what he hopes is happening. Maybe he just needed to get away. Maybe he just wanted to fly around. Maybe he's just trying to, you know, do something else. He misses his home. I, it could be something else. I hope it's something else. And Axe goes, that's an unacceptable amount of maybes. And Jake yeah. goes, yeah. And then he goes, but it's where we are. And as they approach David's house, he goes, I'm going to need you at your most dangerous, which is an Andalite. And Jake says, I'm going in alone. Axe goes, I want to come with you. He goes, no, the only way I'm going to be able to talk to David is alone. So Jake flies past the room a few times trying to get a glance in there. And he sees an eagle sitting on the bedpost. And he's staring at this TV that's just playing that white snow, (laughs) don't have a channel on. So creepy. So creepy. He's staring at that on the TV and crumpled up in his bed in the sheets is a dead red-tailed hawk. And there's blood seeping everywhere. And Jake flies in. (laughs) David turns towards him and starts monologuing about how this is just like being the new kid in school again and he doesn't have to take it and he doesn't have to take orders and they they have this weird click and he doesn't have to you know take it from them anymore and jake screams at him you killed tobias over thinking this is a school thing and he's just jake kind of wavers between being kind of completely cold-blooded, frozen, not frozen, like can't move, but frozen as in he doesn't have any emotions of rage or passion, just ice cold in his veins yep. and just being enraged. Um, and David continues on about how it's a click and he doesn't have to listen to Jake and he knows Jake was threatening him the other night and he isn't going to take it. And Jake is just horrified and david says he has absolutely no remorse over killing just a bird it's not murder it's just an animal it's not because jake says you murdered him and david goes no he's just a bird and then he launches at jake but jake is cool as fuck jake goes flat onto his back to escape david who shoots over him and 
Just like Jake warned, sometimes eagles have problems in small spaces. So Jake scoots under the bed. David can look under there, but he can't get him. Mm -hmm. So David crawls up onto the windowsill and starts to demorph. And Jake can see him demorphing. He knows he's going to be helpless at a certain point in the morph. So when he's approaching that midpoint, Jake crawls out from under the bed and starts scooting towards him, like flapping his wings along the floor. David grabs a piece of splintered wood, and he's going to take a swing at Jake so that Jake can't get out of the window. But Jake's smarter than that. He kind of flaps and scoots along the floor, and then at the last minute flies straight up, talons out, and rakes David across the face mid morph nice. At this point, the hork knock down the door to the bedroom, because of course they're monitoring the house, and they have a truck outside that's ready to go at any moment in time, because... Obviously, he's going to try to come back there. But Jake knocks both him and David out the window. David's screaming like a little fucking (laughs) you-know-what. And uh, they make it out of there. Some hork come out following them out. And Jake's like, oh, God, we're toast. These hork are going to kill us. Until Axe soars over the fence, over the pool, and threatens them. Because Axe is such a badass in this scene. I freaking love him. The hork he's I know. I love him too. The hork freeze because Axe plays up his Andalite arrogance flawlessly. Like, he just goes full like, I'm better than you and I can defeat all of you even though it's three on one and he has no chance. And that gives Axe the split second he needs to scoop up Jake and jump backwards over the pool what the fuck yeah and jake goes i had no idea you could do that and axe goes i didn't either <laughs> <laughs> he just grabs um, bird and like flips over <laughs> yeah he does and it's it's just crazy um like bitches I'm so out. david starts it's it's something so david starts to escape and Jake wants to go after him. Um, X does manage to shake the hork by jumping over another fence and another pool. And the hork don't know there's a pool on the other side. So they land in there. They're away from the hork David's escaping. And Jake wants to go after him. X goes, I'll come with. And Jake orders him to go find Rachel instead. He says, she's nearby. Go get Rachel. And then Jake says, Tobias may have been killed. And X goes, this is a terrible thing. And Jake goes, it's a terrible thing, and if Tobias is dead, we need to get Rachel because we may have to do a terrible thing, too. Uh. (sighs) Yeah. Um, Jake follows David, and they're kind of taunting each other a little bit. Um, And eventually, David's running out of morph time, so Jake says, hey, you better uh, stop soon. And David goes, well, I wasn't sure where we were going to do this, but I guess this is good enough. And they land on the roof of the mall. And they both go to their battle morphs. And David goes, I guess it's time to find out the answer to my question. And as a lion, he charges Jake, who has now gone tiger. And Jake gets in a few good swipes. Um, So does David. Jake goes for the jugular, but with all that mane in the way, he can't get to it. Um, So Jake is frustrated, but pushed back. And when David takes a few more swipes at him, he jumps onto the glass ceiling part and starts slipping, realizing, oh god, we're on glass. And then David leaps at him, and the glass shatters. They go tumbling down. Jake gets bitten along the throat, and he falls into darkness. And that is where this book ends. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> It's so harsh. We're ending this book with Tobias is dead and Jake also is not might in a be dead. Great situation. Yeah, he's dying. Oh my god! I hate David. Yeah, I hate David so much, and the fact that Jake is like we might have to do something terrible as well is just a chilling moment. Yeah. I mean, uh, I I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I wanted so many times to like kind of pause and like ask questions throughout the book, but it's impossible when you're reading through it to kind of interrupt that narrative with that. Sure. It's just so intense. Yeah. (laughs) 
Oh my god. <sighs> but Jake in this book, I love him. He's I love him in this book. He's like peak leader, peak, you know, strategist in this book. Yeah. And at the same time, I can still see the the fissures starting to form where yeah. it's weighing on him and where his, his almost his morals are just starting to deteriorate. Yeah. Um, but like not, they're deteriorating because he's not really having a choice at a certain point. Like yeah. at this point, it's like we might have to kill David because he's killing us and like we've given him so many opportunities but now we really don't have a choice because he's killing our own yeah and they have given him so many opportunities and it what's astounding to me throughout this whole book is one how many times jake was willing to give him a chance and two, how many times David couldn't see what they were doing for him. Yeah. So I guess my question for you at, at the end of this book, since I didn't ask any throughout, is just how did this book leave you feeling when you finished it? Uh, I mean, I was horrified about Tobias. Like... Just based on the, like, the grand scheme of the books, like, I'm pretty sure, like, he's not actually dead. But, I mean, he yeah. could have been dead, like, I don't, I don't know. Um, just, I don't, I don't wish death on anybody, but at this point, I'm like, this guy, he needs to be taken care of, whatever that means. Like, I've never, yeah. I it's been a long time since I've hated a character this severely. And, oh, I don't even know. I don't even know. I was so mad. I was so utterly angry and horrified and disgusted. Because it's, it's not like this was a slow deterioration, necessarily. It's not like... It's not like David did some good stuff, but then had some dark moments, but then, like, just snapped. Like, this was... I, I don't know. Yeah, it... It was... I don't know if this is the same point you're trying to make, but I think it's unforgivable because there's nothing that happened to him that made him this way. He just was awful from the get-go yeah. and entirely within himself yeah Ugh. he he put himself on the outside kind of like the whole time um and he was yeah. never able like honestly i think he, like he's just a sociopath like he can't i don't know like he was never he yeah. doesn't seem to have any sort of empathetic you know tendencies like He's just a monster. <laughs> like, uh. Yeah, and he kind of tries to prevent, pre present himself as having this code of conduct at the end of the book where he's like, oh, I'll kill animals, but I would never kill a human. And it's like the first step to killing people is killing animals. Is killing animals. Yeah. Um. And I don't believe him for a second that he would never kill a person. Oh, yeah. It's, like, he's going down he's, a dark path. <laughs> yeah, and he's just putting out these rules that are completely arbitrary and don't make sense. Um, yeah, and, like, you know, I, I part of me is, like, trying to see it from his perspective. Like, you just lost your parents. You lost your home. You know, you were already feeling like an outsider, before all of this happened and like you're you're scared and you're kind of hopeless and you're driven to these kind of desperate sort of mentalities but the fact of the matter is that like you're not the only one who has lost everything like tobias you know lost everything mm -hmm. and like he didn't turn into this like crazy asshole like, you were an asshole before this all happened. 
Yeah. Yeah. And Axe lost everything, too. Yeah. And Axe lives in the woods, and he has figured it out for himself. <laughs> like, yeah. This is absolutely, like, you, you have a character that, you know, something bad happened to, and you can either be a hero and try to make it better and try to improve on it, or you can become a villain, and David became a villain. Yeah. And the the thing that we don't get so much in this book, but that was Hammer's last book, was Marco also lost his mother to the Yurks. Yeah. But he uses that to drive him to fight yeah. to save the human race instead of to sell them out for his own selfish purposes. Yep. <sighs> Man. Yeah, so that's this book. Uh, and it's it's hard to say anything more at this point because it's like the middle section of a trilogy. So, like, mm-hmm. nothing's really resolved yet. Right. So, the only, like, kind of feeling I had upon finishing this book is just, like, indignancy and rage and, you know, the next... I was so mad. <laughs> it's like, the next book is called The Solution, and, like, my first instinct was, I hope the solution is that Rachel kills David because fuck this guy. <laughs> That's really interesting. So, did you think that... One, did you always think it was going to be Rachel that delivered the final blow, whatever that was? And two, did you think it was going to be death? Um, I, I mean, I had predicted in the last episode we did that something was going to happen with David. And one of my predictions mm-hmm. was that he was going to die and that one of the Animorphs might be the one to kill him. Um, since it ends on a Rachel book... Um, I thought, you know, that's just kind of a natural connection. But then yeah. when he, you know, kills Tobias, I'm like, you just killed Rachel's boyfriend. She's going to fuck you up. Like, so, I mean, there was just yeah. all these arrows are pointing towards like that being the conclusion. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And it, it would have been interesting to see it go different ways like i think it would have been not to spoil what happens in the next book but um let's say if the killing blow was delivered like i think it would have been very interesting to have rachel going after him and have like marco be the one to actually deliver whatever the killing blow was yeah. like i think there could have been a lot of interesting ways to do that but yeah it's all signs are pointing towards rachel being the one to resolve this mm-hmm. but So interesting. And on... It was interesting even before we get the conversations that happen later on that when something happened to Tobias, Jake, who always is kind of a little conservative in his descriptions of other character interactions, he relies mostly on Cassie for that. He doesn't say, I think, you know, Rachel and Marco are this, or I think Rachel and Tobias are this. And he says, you know, I like Cassie like I like her. It was interesting that in that moment, Jake was like, Tobias is dead. Go get Rachel. Get Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this man. is very telling. It, it it was very telling. He, I mean, he always knows more than he lets on, even to us, the reader in his own head. But it was just, it was a chilling moment. Yeah. <laughs> like, because it's, it, it's like when you unleash, like, the final beast at the end of, of a fight like we didn't want to go this far like we didn't want to throw you into the sarlacc pit yeah but we're gonna yeah. <laughs> oh. oh man um. yeah <laughs> i mean i was just thinking about like um our, our like character rating thing uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, if we do a character rating, that everybody gets a five in this book because they're all such good kids, and David gets a negative five billion. Yeah, like, I agree. By comparison, this horrific person, all the kids look amazing <laughs> compared to. And, and surprise star rating, Visor Three gets two stars from me in this book <laughs> because he is basically on the good guy side. Right He's now. like, you guys are having issues. I'm gonna kill that line because I hate him. <laughs> 
Like, how shitty of a person do you have to be where even Visitor 3 is like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> oh, man. So uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, he... He's like infighting, ha ha ha, and then he's like, "Oh God, the lion! <laughs> he's he's really a dick. I understand it." Yeah. Oh, oh my God, I, I yeah, Visor Three gets he gets you know bonus points for me <laughs> in this book. All the kids are five stars plus plus plus. David, fucking, how bad can I make it for right. you? What's the lowest like, I can go? <laughs> what's the lowest I can go? For you, David. What is our lowest rating? Can we decide that so we can use it? I I mean, even if we set a low bar, I'm gonna go below that because How what if David is our lowest rating now? You can get stars, you can get to merits. (laughs) On a scale of five to David. He was a hundred percent David. Oh my god, you're being (laughs) such a David right now. (laughs) Such a David. (laughs) Oh Uh, I hate hate it so much oh my god he's the worst he's the absolute worst man i hope that there is a weird like kind of warble in the ratings after this trilogy for every reader that was named david reading this series that was like oh my god (laughs) i swear i'm not that bad oh no yeah or yeah we're not saying that if your name is david you're you're cursed with the the animorphs david curse (laughs) Yeah, no, we're not saying that at all. We know good Davids. Good, good Davids. Yep. But this David is a bad, bad David. Yes. And we hate yes. him. <sighs> like, I truly... I I don't know. I mean, a lot of the times books don't... Like, I don't cry a lot when I'm reading and things like that. Like, I don't get really emotional. But last night, after finishing this book, I was shaking with rage for half an hour after reading like i was so angry and just and i know what happens that's the other thing i know how this plays out um i think i think the last character that i really hated this badly was um professor umbridge from harry potter oh god no redeeming qualities with that one yeah oh god and that was like a you know thousand page book just full of misery and this is only like two hundred pages. <laughs> yeah, like a hundred. We I think all of these net out around one hundred and fifty. Yeah. Um, and that's. I mean, I know we've been talking about how good the writing is, but like for Applegate to be able to make us hate somebody this much in just under what one hundred and fifty eight. So like yeah. three hundred and fifty pages of writing. Yeah. We hate this guy. Well, and <laughs> like that's very good. Oh God, I. And but the thing is, he's not. We don't hate him to the point where it's like, you are clearly like not a believable character. He is so believable. Oh like, yeah. There are people oh, yeah. like this in the world. Yeah, we've met some. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> um, uh. which I just I love. I absolutely writing such a hateable character but also being like i i hate it so much because i know this is a real you know type of person like oh god Mm -hmm. it's so and then you kind of feel bad for hating them in like a weird way (laughs) at least i do um i i mean i probably did the first read through but not now (laughs) i mean it's like again like there's part of me that pities david but it's also like you could have gone a very different direction and you chose to go a really dark direction and now you are unredeemable, basically. Yeah. Ugh, God. Yeah. Well, do we, ha- do we have any more closing thoughts on this or do we want to close this up so we can get in depth in the next one? Let's, let's get into the next one. Okay, because I feel like we're going to be able to talk a lot more yes. openly once we yes. have the resolution. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I guess now's the time to mention that despite it really not being great for this, 
the next book we have duplicates of <laughs> is book 22, Yay. <laughs> The Solution. Yay. Yay. Um, but Casey and I were talking before we started recording this and realized you probably don't want our notes in that book because the pages are going to be torn. There's going to be a lot of angry pen writing that scribbles. will show up for probably six pages, yeah. scribbles, crossing out David's name and writing like hate, Profanity. you know, that yeah, sort of thing. It's... Right. A lot of profanity in children's books. It's unacceptable, really. <laughs> so um, we're doing a little bit of a different kind of a prize for this one. We're still going to do it because we got such great interactions last time with everyone. So our plan for this one is we're going to send you the duplicate copy of the book to whoever wins this one. But instead of writing notes, we're going to send you an illustration from that book as well from each of us, just like a print of it. It'll be pretty cool, I swear. That's what we're going to give you because we can't write notes in this book because they're so <laughs> it would mad. Be bad. <laughs> um, and the question that we want you to answer is to take yourselves back to the last book when everyone was voting on whether or not to make David an Animorph and tell us, would you have voted yes or no at that point and why? So that's what we want to know. And we'll send you some stuff. Yep. <laughs> It'll be a good time, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> and by that, I mean horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the next duplicate I have, but I have no control over what I have duplicates over. Woo. <sighs> I mean, I guess I could, like, buy duplicates, but that would really ruin the mystique of this. <laughs> so, I'm not gonna. And that is the game plan. Uh, so, write us at anonymousanimorphs at gmail.com, which is our email address. If you want to find more of this, you can go onto Facebook and look up Animorphs Anonymous, or you can go to our super secret special awesome group, which is facebook.com slash group slash Animorphs Anonymous, or search Andalite Bandalites. You want to tweet at us, if you want to at us, it's at Animorphs Anon. <laughs> if you want to find us on Instagram, where we post all of my very terrible image compilations for each episode, no, it's great. at Animorphs Anonymous. <laughs> they're great. Sometimes they have our faces on them. Sometimes they have our faces on them. Most of the time they don't. But every once in a while they do. The Jurassic Park one was particularly good for me. <laughs> so good. I loved it so much. <sighs> Casey, tell me about your, your comic. Oh gosh, I have a comic. It's called Beside You. It's about music and romance in the early 2000s. Um, you can check that out at BesideYouComic.com or you can find it on Tapas.io and search for Beside You. Please read it. I love it. It's my baby. And it's glorious, and it plays all the musics that we want to hear for all of us who are stuck in the 90s to early 2000s. The best era. Um, the best era. <laughs> if you want more of our podcast and you don't like your podcast service, you can find us at iTunes, Google Play, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, Podbean, uh, Podcast Republic, or anywhere podcasts are sold for free. Yep, which is my favorite dollar <laughs> I don't have a good joke for this end that relates back to the book because I'm so angry. I'm also the angriest. Let's, let's right. go. Let's go eat a sandwich and we'll feel less angry, maybe, and then we'll resume being angry with the next episode. That sounds like a plan. And uh, I just want you to know, audience, if you fly away right now, I will not consider you traitors as long as you come back for the next episode. <laughs> That's all I got. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>